Welcome, my name is Mitch Sanders. I'm the uh, uh, chair of the uh, Communications Committee for the Wound Healing Society. And today I have uh, Dr. Ian Dixon uh, from the University of Manitoba, the Institute of uh, Cardiac and Vascular Sciences. Uh, Ian, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch. Nice to be here. And uh, today we're going to discuss a paper, the novel factors that activate and deactivate uh, cardiac fibroblasts. The next perspective of treatment of cardiac fibrosis. So, Ian, welcome again. Uh, thank you for for joining us on this um, wound repair regeneration fireside chat. Um, why don't we start with the 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 issue around uh, heart attack and cardiac fibrosis and what's going on in the normal process? Sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to talk about that. So, um, you know, the heart is different from from skin. And when we talk about fibrosis of anything, it's usually regarded as a lesion. And in the skin, though, it looks like the fibroblasts activate to myofibes. They follow a very prescribed pattern of, of wound healing, which involves scar formation and, and wound contraction, which is brought about by the contractility of the myofibroblasts. And then when all of that is done, they receive uh, an apoptotic signal the mitochondria transition to to be primed for apoptosis, to use David Lagares' term, and then the cells vanish; they disappear. The apoptose they go away. The scar remains, and it slowly turns over with with quiescent, so-called quiescent fibroblasts, and happily ever after um, exists without any problem, as long as you take enough vitamin C, etc to keep those cells happy. But in the heart, you know, it's an interesting thing. If we, if we look at the teleometry of, of the question as to maybe why something is the way it is, rather than just look at mechanism all the time, you know, you might look at the heart and think, hmm, looks like the heart may not be evolved as an organ, as an organ to, to be damaged in such a way that it has to do wound healing. Right, because when you look at cardiac wound healing compared to skin, it's a mass of chaos. <laughs> so what happens is you get this. You know, let's say you have uh, you eat too many, you go to McDonald's too many times, and and your coronaries plug up, or they they may just do that naturally through genetics, bad genetics. But let's say that you have an MI or a heart attack. A good chunk of the muscle is then ischemic, and it simply withers and dies and if you're lucky there's no loss of of uh of that uh, ventricular wall those cells die anyway the parenchymal muscle cells die and they're replaced with myofibroblasts and and the the wall of the heart thins the rest of the geometry of the heart goes crazy it actually it goes through a hypertrophic stage and so it loses its normal geometry which is a bad thing all by itself because it likes to be nice and compact for, for compact beats. That's just the way the heart is. It doesn't fill too much and it likes to contract in a very, very coordinated way, almost like it's wringing itself out. But when you've got this huge like spinnaker of a scar on the side of the heart wall, that can happen. But the other thing that goes on, which is really insidious, is, is that the myofibroblasts come in there like they're supposed to. And they usually are sourced, I think there was a couple of papers, one by Kinesikak back in 2017 already, it's a long time ago, to show that the, the cells that come in are actually derived from the heart muscle itself. So the cells come in, they activate to myofibes, the myofibroblasts create, they do the wound healing, you go through uh, several stages of wound healing, the scar is formed and you think everything is great, but the problem is, is that the scar remains crawling with these senescent myofibroblasts. So what is a senescent myofibroblast? These are not lazy cells by any means, but what they are is they're almost primed for, for death. They, their mitochondria, again, are all set up for apoptosis, but they are held in that state. They're not allowed to disappear and go away as they would in skin. So rather what happens is in the heart, those cells continue to exist, which is a bad thing. So they begin to make too much scar. And then that spills over into the right ventricle, into the surviving left ventricle, 
and you wind up with the heart as kind of a hockey puck, which can neither fill properly anymore. You've already lost the geometry because you have this giant spinnaker, as I said. I think of it as a spinnaker in a high wind, you know, like on a sailboat of a scar sitting there, which flops around. And then you you are also populating that part of the heart with these myofibes, which eventually make their way into the otherwise healthy myocardium and then carry out interstitial fibrosis of that part of the heart. So it's just wound healing gone crazy. It's it, it doesn't know when to stop and there is no good signal for it. And I think part of the reason for that is that you have too many things contributing to support uh, those cells so that they're not allowed, they're not allowed to simply apoptose and go away. And so my paper kind of focuses on on a number of, uh, not even all of the, the most recent, there's so many factors now that are that are identified. But I've, I've tried to highlight a couple that tend to pull that myofibroblast back to the quiescent phase. And then some of the others that tend to push it into the active phase. So for the active phase, I've highlighted periostin, and I talk a little bit and give some data about PDGF uh, receptor alpha, which turns out to be a pretty good marker of a myofibe. So there we have another interesting thing is that in heart, you know, the heart is a very active organ. It's busy, contracting, moving around. And I think what's going on there is because there's always some mechanical input, those myofibes are very different from the myofibes that you might find in the skin or from the lung, et cetera, even though there is movement there too. The heart is a very violent place. <laughs> and I think some of the, the biomechanical input that, that those cells see almost primes them to be like a proto-myofibroblast even before they are activated. And so it makes it doubly hard to turn them off and to try and find a molecular switch, if you will, to bring them back into uh, a mode where they're quelling disease rather than contributing to it. So could you talk a little bit about SKI and its known kind of regulatory effects on the TGF beta and SMOD? Sure, yeah. Uh, well, SMAD signaling is something that we got into years ago. Uh, I'm really dating myself, but when I think about how many years ago, uh, it could be late 90s is when we discovered that SMADs were, were pretty important pro-fibrotic factor. And of course, they're part of the TGF beta signal, and it's become, you know, old hat now to talk about SMADs as uh, being involved in fibrosis. But um, back in 97, 98, 99, we published a series of papers which labeled the SMADs up as, as you know, the prime movers and players in a pro-fibrotic scenario. So what does SKI do? SKI is discovering, discovered in, in New York uh, by a bunch of molecular biologists at the Sloan Kettering Institute, SKI, so they call it SKI. And of course, it's a member of some other families of proteins, or a family of proteins. So they labeled those snow and snow N. So we have ski, snow, and snow N. And ski is the one that's received all of the, um, uh, or, or at least most of, of the um, research attention, because it seems to be an endogenous inhibitor of TGF beta. And so the nice thing about ski, or, or the kind of striking thing about this protein, is that it's very, very old. So if you look at a sea sponge crawling along on the ocean floor, it expresses a form of ski. And of course, all the mammalian forms, every, every mammal that you can think of expresses ski. So it's a very, it's an abundant protein and it's also ancient. And so mother nature being as complex as she is, what she does is she gives, depending on the cell type, those old, old proteins can do very different things depending on the, on the parenchymal cell. So it happens that in, in our cells, or at least in the cardiac fibroblasts that we study, when we overload or, or flood the cell with ski, and even in the, in the situation where we're hitting them with lots of TGF beta to try and, and activate these cells, ski actually dials back that phenotype. So it pushes them into a quiescent phenotype. 
So in a very simplistic way, you know, years ago, this was around 2011, and I had a, a very talented um, PhD student by the name of uh, Ryan Cunnington and several others uh, following up, including Natalie Landry, who have uh, contributed, you know, enormously to our program. And I always just throw a plug in for the students. You know, any good investigator who doesn't admit that that we ride on the shoulders of our students is probably not telling the truth. So <laughs> my, my hat's off to the, uh, the students. They, they have been huge contributors. But so what, what uh, Ryan discovered all those years ago was that, yeah, if we put these, this protein into, um, into a vector that allows us to put them into these activated myofibes, it dials back their expression of alpha smooth oxalactin. It takes down their contractility. It basically calms them down. It turns off their high expression of collagens one and three, et cetera. So we started having some very basic ideas about, well, oh, how can we harness ski then as, as a putative antifibrotic? Is that even possible? And, and um, you know, I always get the question, can you make, you know, a ski pill? Can you, is there any way that you can turn this into a, a small molecule uh, that could do the same things as ski? And I suppose one could do that by finding out the exact uh, sequence of peptides that, that provides that disrupting bridge um, action. And so I didn't explain this, but what ski does, it hooks onto the SMAD complex and it takes a piggyback and rides all the way into the nucleus from the cytosol goes right with the smads and in the perfect inhibitor it sits right on with the smads as they bind to the smad binding element to ostensibly activate that gene right let's say it's collagen collagen has a bunch of of sbes in front of it, smad sure. binding elements sure and and ski just sits there and it shuts the whole thing off we don't know exactly how it does that but if we could figure out a small molecule drug with that peptide sequence, it might not be very, very large at all. Just something to glom onto the SMADs so that they are interfered with as they bind to the SBE, then you would have a great antifibrotic drug. Right. The the idea is that it's probably the hydrophobic regions or the polyperylene regions of ski. And yeah. um, that are kind of locking down the kind of big tyrosines and phenylalanines as SMAD. But um, no, it's a really interesting concept. Now, SKI is also a proto-oncogene. So in, in tumor cells, you also see it a kind of an indicator of that things have gone aruck in melanoma, for instance. So it's, it's, yeah. you've got to be careful what you wish for in some of these drug treatments, right? Yeah. Um, I learned a long time ago not to put that reference of ski as a proto-onc into my grants because <laughs> that, that raises a number of, of uh, questions naturally so but but again ski is is an interesting and in our cells very specific binder of smads and yes it's a proto-onc but not in these cells i think i think all of those functions are are masked or they're they're kind of just put in the back pocket but, in, but what, the, yeah. Yeah, in the case of being able to treat it locally or, you know, there's still a, you know, a good chance of sometimes, even with a, a lot of the things that we treat uh, to heal wounds are, yeah. are somewhat oncogenic or somewhat too proliferative for all the time. But if you could control the on and off or have a half-life, which is short, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and and it's a it's a great point because the natural half life of ski is only about thirty minutes. Oh wow! Isn't that interesting? So it fits right in with what you're saying. It's really That's cool. cool. Uh, so there's not. So I guess my point is there's not a lot of naturally occurring compounds that tend to turn off fibrosis or at least dial back this activated myofibroblastic form of of the cells that are responsible. So, so uh, that's why I tend to focus on. There's so many things that do turn it up, and and the um, the two that I mentioned are periostin. 
Perry Austin is a great marker for myofibes, and it's relatively novel. It's causing a lot of excitement. It's been around now almost 10 years. We've yeah. known about it quite a long time. But like most of these pro proteins, it takes at least 10 or 20 years before we know enough about them that we can actually exploit them. Um, Perry Austin is, is a paracrine signal. So as soon as, let's say that you put down a, a harmless fibroblast onto um, a very stiff substrate, they activate within 10 hours. So they just, just the, the act of putting them on a very stiff, high Young's modulus substrate, such as a scar, for example, take a regular cell, put it on the scar, they activate to a myofibe, and lo and behold, they start cranking out periostin as well. So it makes a great marker for activated five myofibes, which we didn't have even a couple of years ago. Not, not really. I mean, we've always used alpha smooth muscle actin, but that's also present in smooth muscle too. Um, myofibes and periostin seem to be connected at the hip, which is a good development. And it, it's led to a lot of interesting mouse models where people uh, tend to use periostin as, as a switch to do inducible either knock-ins or knock-outs so that we can start to manipulate these cells very, very um, well, much more effectively than just chucking a drug onto them. For example. And you can't knock out ski, right? Because it's so essential for, the, for life, right? You, you can't. Yeah, we... There was a group that tried this in France years ago, and it's lethal. It's embryonic lethal. So ski is so old that it's probably needed for development. And if you knock it out from birth, it doesn't work. So we're right now we're in the midst of um, just we've started gathering data where we um, have made a um, an, an inducible cardiac specific knock in knockout for ski actually, so that we can. Let the animals breed. We can start assessing them uh, for, for cardiac function. We can feed them tamoxifen, and lo and behold, ski is knocked out. And then we can can give them an MI or whatever, and then follow the the, the course of fibrosis with and without ski. So it's we're really getting cool. a better handle on what ski can do. It's really cool. So. Uh... We don't have enough time to. I'd love to talk for hours. <laughs> um, why don't we um, call it to a close? And thank you so much for the wonderful article in Wound Repair and Regeneration. And I think the work you've been doing is is wonderful. And I and I think I mentioned before, if any of your students are looking for jobs, we're always hiring. So please keep us in mind. So thank oh, you, well, Ian. It's a real pleasure and uh, great science. Really great work. Thank you, Mitch. I appreciate it and. Good to see you again. Thank you. Take care. Cheers.